Father, thank you so much for being able to study uh, your word. Uh, thank you for the power of your word, the beauty of your word, the promises of your word. Uh, thank you for the simplicity of the word that um, a child can uh, walk through your word and see uh, easily the way of salvation. At the same time, your word is an ocean uh, that has no bottom, uh, that can uh, never be completely searched out. I pray that you would help us today as we look at the Sermon on the Mount. I pray you would encourage us. I pray that we would love you more uh, when we finish today. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. So we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount today. And uh, the Sermon on the Mount is the longest verbatim record of what Jesus taught. And you can even tell that and I've got the red letter Bible turned on. Uh, you can see it. This is the most pages in a row of stuff that Jesus said. Uh, what's interesting is the call of Matthew doesn't come until uh, chapter 8. Uh, and uh, when Jesus calls him, uh, Matthew leaves everything and follows. But the interesting thing is the this longest verbatim sermon um, is only in Matthew. And so it raises a question, uh, where did it come from? We're going to dive into that question. But I think the most powerful thing you can ever do with scripture is read it. And so even though it's three chapters, it's going to take about 12 minutes. Um, I want to read it and then we'll use the time remaining just to talk about it. So this is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and this is what God's Word says. Seeing the crowd, crowds, he went up to the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the spiritually bankrupt, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who cry their eyes out, for they're the ones who will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land by lot. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they'll be stuffed to the gills with it. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Uh, the B'nai Ha Elohim, if uh, you remember from the other day. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how will its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and be trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but put it on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest stroke of the pen, not the least dot will pass from the law until it is all fulfilled. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. You've heard that it was said of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will, not, will be liable to judgment, and whoever insults his brother be liable to the council. And whoever says you moron will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you're offering a gift at the altar and there, remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift 
there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer the gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you that you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You've heard it said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it's better that you you lose one of your members than that the, your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be yes or no, and anything more than that comes from evil. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you. And do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, who makes his sun shine, rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? But if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect. How perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Beware of practicing righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the street corners, that they may be seen by other people. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do, for they think they'll be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, our Father in the heavens, may your name be made holy. May your kingdom come. May your will be done. The same way in heaven that it's done, may be done on earth the same exact way that it's done in heaven. Continually give us today, or blanket give us today our daily bread, and forgive us the same way we also have forgiven our debtors. And please do not lead us into temptation temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For if you forgive others their trans trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And when you fast, 
do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, and that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they've received their reward. When you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroys and where thieves dig through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light in you is darkness, how great the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either we will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, about your body, what you put on? Isn't life more than food? Isn't the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the length of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the Lilies of the field, how they grow, neither do they toil or spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these. But if God clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O one of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first, continually seek first, the kingdom of God, the rule of God, the reign of God, and seek his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. Therefore, don't be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient is the day for its own trouble. Uh, stop judging other people so that you not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why? Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye and don't notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye. Then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give to the dogs what's holy. Do not throw your pearls before swine, lest they trample you underfoot and attack you. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? So what, whatever you wish others to do for you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. In a, by the narrow gate, for the great gate is wide, and the way easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes? Are figs gathered from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears diseased fruit. 
healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, and the diseased tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. On that day, many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy, preach, proclaim God's word in your name, cast out demons in your name? Did we not do mighty miracles in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And when the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the wind blew and beat against that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. And when Jesus had finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not like their scribes. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. That's the longest sermon. Uh, it's like 12 minutes, uh, I think, uh, reading through it. Um, Matthew wasn't part of the uh, 12 disciples, but uh, evidently he was there. He heard it. Uh, it pricked his heart. Uh, perhaps Jesus saw him uh, in the crowd just on the edge of his seat. And a few uh, paragraphs later, Jesus sees him and he calls him. And he welcomes him to be one of the 12 disciples. What do you find interesting about that sermon? What do you find challenging? What do you find confusing? What do you find encouraging? Holland? I thought it was really interesting that Jesus was giving commands and instructions on top of the mountain. Um, Jesus is giving commands and instructions on top of the mountain. What did you find interesting about that? Well, because Moses received the Ten Commandments from God on a mountain. Moses received the Ten Commandments on a mountain from God. Now Jesus is doing a new Moses thing. And as we saw when we looked at the overview of Matthew, it divides the book into five sections. So Matthew clearly is presenting Jesus as a new Moses. Uh, and we even have the birth narratives where uh, Pharaoh tried to kill Moses and Herod tried to kill Jesus. And both times they were saved. Uh, I think Matthew's the one who tells us that uh, Joseph and Mary went down to Egypt uh, just like Moses was in Egypt. So there's all this new Moses uh, parallel. Absolutely. Uh, what else do you find interesting? Do you see, uh, Alex? It's not something that I found interesting as much as a question I had. Um, we see Jesus talking about fasting and um, you know, not disfiguring your face and whatnot. Um, fasting, of course, is not very common in our culture today. What was the purpose of fasting back then? Well, uh, fasting... Uh, is in the Old Testament a sign of mourning. Um, it's a sign that uh, you're recognizing that you're guilty before God and you're seeking the face of God for him to do something uh, for you. Often when people would fast, they would put uncomfortable clothes on uh, so that it would add to their uh, discomfort. Uh, sometimes they would put dirt on their head. Uh, um, Sometimes that wasn't the case. Moses fasted in the presence of God, and perhaps he didn't even realize he was fasting. He was there 40 days. He didn't drink water. He didn't eat food, and yet he didn't die. That would have killed anybody on earth, but in God's presence, uh, something else was ministering to him. Perhaps it was God's presence. And I wonder if fasting in the Old Testament, fasting in the New, doesn't have all of those ideas uh, tied up uh, with it. What else do you find interesting? Morgan? Um, well, something that I've just always found really interesting is that 
beginning of chapter 7, Jesus says, do not judge that you will not be judged. And that's where everybody stops reading and says, why? Because they want to say, you can't judge me for my sin. And yet, the rest of the chapter goes on to say, you can tell by the fruits who is truly saved and who isn't. So, so Jesus is not saying you just can't ever judge. So judging isn't uh, looking at the fruit in someone's life. Because Jesus tells us to do that just a few verses away. Judging must be something different than that. And uh, Morgan, have you given any uh, thought of what that might be? Well, also taking a look at the rest of the verses directly after that, the speck and the log. Um, it seems like what Jesus is saying is that you can't tell is that he, you can't condemn someone for sinning when you're committing the exact same sin. When you're committing the exact same sin. And in critiquing the speck, you're denying the log in your own eye. That's what we're told not to do. Um, and we can be charming, I think, in the way that we confront people with that. Jesus was charming with the woman at the well. I mean, he could have, you know, called her every name in the book, but he doesn't. He confronts her sin, but he does it in a way that doesn't uh, obliterate her as a person. When he interacts with the scribes and Pharisees, he does point out their sin much more directly because they're denying their sin. Uh, it is interesting that in the Greek, when it says don't judge, it's written in a way, and I tried to reflect that when I read it, don't continually judge someone. Uh, don't, you know, where you're just looking at their life and all you're saying is, God, why, you know, why is that person so bad? I think biblically you can look at someone's life and say, um, this person is mired in sin, but their seeds of corruption are no different from my seeds of corruption. And even if I'm not tempted by that particular sin, I'm tempted by others. And uh, if we all, everyone in heaven's going to uh, agree uh, and say, God says, why are you here? We're all going to agree and say, uh, we're undeservedly here because you've shown grace to the people who should be in hell. Everybody in heaven is going to have to share that. And it's not denying that there is sin. It's just uh, admitting that because we're all polluted, uh, that none of us can say, well, I sought God on my own. I did this on my own. Um, all of it's uh, by by grace. What else do you find interesting? Gloriana? Um, well, I found interesting how in Matthew 5, um, the last half of Matthew 5, he goes through and he lists, he goes through a bunch of mosaic, um, I guess you call them um, kind of laws that Moses set he's, up. He's going through the Ten Commandments and he quotes it six, seven, um, it's unclear what others, but he's clearly quoting six and seven. But I find it interesting that he goes through and he, it seems like he's telling the people, these are what you've been given. And this is how you're misunderstanding what I've been trying to tell you and misunderstanding the law that has been given to you. And don't, you're misunderstanding it. Don't do it this way. This is what you're supposed to be doing instead. Or this is what you're supposed to be doing rather. Yeah, the requirement. I mean, take the adultery law. Most people come to the adultery law and say, have I technically committed adultery? And many people would say, no, I haven't technically committed adultery. And Jesus says, that's not what the law is about. The law is about your heart. Uh, have you committed adultery in your heart uh, secretly when nobody else knows? And it's like, well, yeah. And Jesus says, you've broken that law. And that's what it seemed like Jesus was trying to show them was that they were focusing more on, okay, well, they were going through the motions. Being very, External. Okay, I've, I've done this, done this, and he's telling them, no, I'm not as much concerned with what you do as your heart is tempted to do the right thing. Yeah. If I keep from, you know, killing someone 
you know, God's not going to say, oh, you're a great moral person. Well, what have you thought about doing, you know, uh, you know, you stand on the horn and, you know, speak in strange and foreign tongues, you know, uh, have you murdered that person? And Jesus says, yes. And Jesus says, even uh, devaluing someone, if you say of someone, you're a moron. Jesus says that violates murder. You have devalued them as made in the image of God in a way that's outlawed by that um, command. Becca? I missed all this talk of the lotto, and all of this seems so futile. Like, even the, like, even if it is about your heart, and like, that's not even something that I can achieve as a human being. And so I'm just really excited about, like, grace today. And the verse in Isaiah especially, um, Oh, Lord, you will ordain peace for us, for you have indeed done all of our works. <laughs> you have indeed done all our works for us. Like, help me with that. Does that verse just blow you away? So this is the people of God in heaven, and they're saying... You've done all our good works for us. So, Becca, help me. Jesus is preaching the law here. You want to be right with God, do the law. Do the law. You want to make it to heaven? Easy. Get the Ten Commandments. Uh, no, this is how they're going to be interpreted. You want to get to um, heaven, just do the law. And so, you, Becca, you do that. You get the list and you say, okay, this is the law. This is how Jesus interpreting the law and you go I'm going to hell 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 you know it's like I'm breaking all ten of these commandments every second of my life and Jesus says if you want to get to heaven perfectly obey the law so Becca you're Matthew and you're sitting in the back row and you're hearing this and you're a person who has lived your entire life by stealing money from other people. And you're a person where your very profession, even in this sermon, Jesus picks you out as an example of someone totally wicked. Why is this uh, sermon encouraging to you, Becca? Because I recognize that like, I am utterly dead absent from the of Christ and like going back to uh, I think chapter 5 yeah chapter 5 talking about uh, that he's not come to get rid of the law to abolish it but that Christ came to fulfill Fill it perfectly the law. and then to, to fill us what, what, what's the very opening sentence in the Sermon on the Mount blessed are the spiritually bankrupt when you don't have two spiritual nickels to rub together before God, you're blessed. Can you identify with that? It's like, okay, you've told me to do the law, but you also said blessed are the people who are the spiritually homeless people, blessed are the spiritually bankrupt, blessed are those who can't rub two spiritual nickels together, blessed are those who, uh, as far as getting into heaven based on their own righteousness, Blessed are the people who are 10 gazillion miles away from that. You're blessed when that's true of you. And don't you just see Matthew saying, well, I don't know how all this other stuff works out, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write that on my wall. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that in the mirror, on the bathroom mirror, blessed are the spiritually bankrupt, because I don't know how all this other stuff works out, but I am spiritually bankrupt. I have nothing inherently to offer to God, and then you then you see how you're much more ready to hear the new covenant and the promise, the new covenant promises, because it's not about you being able to achieve it. Blessed are you, Lord, because you've done all our works for it. John three twenty one. Those who love the light come into the light that it might be shown that their deeds are quote having been done in God. Laura. Yes, sir. Uh, this might Finally, I got your name. I'm sorry. It took me so long. <laughs> it's okay. Um, it might sound like a silly question, but what exactly 
is a spiritual man. What do you mean? What does Christ mean when he says the spiritually bankrupt? What what is that? Right. Exactly? So like the word in Matthew five there so there are different words for poverty um, in Greek. This word for poor is this word patokos and uh, you know, it starts off economically disadvantaged, dependent on other people for support. Um, in terms of the word for poor, the, uh, being thrust on divine resources, um, being extremely inferior in quality, being miserable. Do you see this uh, definition there? And so all these words are like, poverty this is a penniless person so like not two nickels not even two nickels somebody who has nothing so do you do you see how the law trying to fulfill the law will bring you to desperation so uh, Jesus says uh, to you Laura um, you want to not murder somebody really easy just for every single person you meet estimate them as the image of God as that image requires for your neighbor love your neighbors yourself and so we say who's my neighbor and so God says okay let me tell you a story about an ISIS terrorist who um, was nice to somebody else. Was he the neighbor? Yeah. He's your neighbor. So, it's easy. Don't murder. Just love your neighbors yourself. It's like, uh, okay. And everybody's my neighbor. Even, even the most foul person on the planet is my neighbor. And love them that way. And it's like, can't do it and Jesus said well be perfect be God perfect and you say I can't do it and Jesus says try and you say I'm a wicked just love other and do you see how the more and more you're forced in that you come to the place where you realize okay I, I can do an outward show I, you know, there are a couple of things in life that I'm like world class at. One is holding a grudge. I can hold a grudge better. I can do that better than anybody I know. Be petty. Be, you know, I can do that. I'm really good at that. And the other is I am a really, really, really good hypocrite. Because I can, I can put on outward airs. But in terms of revealing the wickedness that remains in my uh, unredeemed flesh, I'm really, really good about uh, covering that up. I, I remember as a pastor, and this is going to be funny to you, but it's funny, but it shows how wicked I am as a human being. I remember between Sunday school and church one day where a man just hit me on the wrong day, and what he did was wicked, uh, but I was sitting there, and I, you know, pastor in Presbyterian church, have, you know, it's a formal church. I had a robe on. We were in the parking lot. And I remember praying to God, God, help me not hit him. You know, I was thinking, I'm a little bit bigger than he is. He's a little bit craftier than I am. But I remember thinking, God, please help me not hit him. And I was kind of just shaking a little. And I'm running through my mind is this is going to look really bad, right? The pastor and the clerk of session rolling around in the parking lot trying to beat each other to death. You know, it's going to be we're we're just across the street from the newspaper. The police station is just down the road, and I'm playing out in my mind, God, please help me not hit this man. And I know he wanted to hit me too, and we were saying wicked things to each other. And I would like to say, oh, well, that, you just caught me on a bad day, you know. 
Well, let me tell you, when you squeeze a tube of toothpaste, the only stuff that can come out is the stuff that was inside. So I'm really good at hypocrite at presenting that I'm a pretty good person. But the truth is, and the truth is about you, you've got wicked stuff inside you. Uh, you've got stuff that your flesh wants you to do that's wicked, and it's like hell wicked. And we get very good at trying to pretend that isn't there. But Jesus, in preaching the law, is just pulling the uh, layers of the onion a way where we can begin to see a little bit of the corruption. And Jesus says, you want to be heaven, be perfect. And you say, God, I can't be perfect. Just love your neighbor. I, I want to kill my neighbor sometime. God, just, you know, live a sexually pure life. And you want to say, God, have you driven down the interstate these days and seen what's on billboards? Or if you flip through cable t TV, uh, or, oh my goodness, do you realize what's on the internet? God says, you want to you want to live in heaven, be pure. Uh, you want to be in heaven, don't covet. You want to be in heaven, tell the truth all the way. You want to be in heaven, um, and those are the easy ones, right? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What does Jesus not quote? He doesn't quote one, two, three, four, five, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, mind, strength. Don't have an idol. Uh, don't take God's name in vain. Uh, was I profaning God's name that day when I was thinking about how how quickly I could move my arm back in in a um, robe and could I punch him in the nose? Could I knock him out before I realized I was punching him? That, that's what was running through my and you know was it gonna. Was it going to slow me down that I had a robe on? That ran through my mind. It probably ran through his, his mind as well. That wasn't the abnormal thing. That was the real fleshly me that Jesus came to save. And it's only when the true um, rule of the law starts getting put up against our life where you realize your utter helplessness and it takes us to the place of utter spiritual bankruptcy and we say Jesus if I'm going to be a right person you're going to have to make me a right person if I'm going to love God with all my heart soul mind and strength you're going to have to blessed are the pure in heart how do you get a pure heart David tells us how you get a pure heart he says blank in me O oh God a pure heart what does he use create you mean like create ex nihilo of Genesis 1 like God coming to something dead, dark, without form and void, and God saying, let there be light. If I'm going to have a pure heart, what's it going to take from God? It's going to take an act of God. It's going to take God creating in me what is not there on my own. And when we come to the place of spiritual bankruptcy, then we're ready to hear the gospel that's going to change who we are from the inside out. And that's what we're going to pick up tomorrow. So I'll see you then.